it is great being here. Um, my name is Ginger Merritt, and I am coordinator of instructional technology for Los Angeles County Office of Education. Um, I've been in education for 17 years, and I am really excited to be here. Um, I had a friend of mine um, who uh, is the director of teacher preparation, um, Dennis Eastman, and he called me and said, hey, I was going to be speaking at this event, and I am going to now be in Lebanon, so I can't do that. <laughs> so, so would you be willing to um, step up and speak? And I was so excited. I um, have worked with Los Angeles County Office of Education, and um, I've worked primarily with adjudicated youth, which are students that um, are in trouble with the law and also Division of Special Education across the county. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today, and you see it um, behind you, it's something that is very near and dear to my heart because students say it all the time. Ms. Merritt, I read it, but I don't really get it. Like, I, re I read it five times, and I still don't know what it says. And so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna learn three really specific strategies that you can do when you're reading something, no matter what type of text it is, so you can actually remember what you're reading, so you don't have to um, go back and reread it and reread it and still get to the end and shrug your shoulders and just move on because you just really didn't understand what it was saying. So that's kind of where we're going. But first, let me just tell you, um, I, uh, I'm a diver, I'm a scuba diver, and I'm a little distracted right now because this time next week, I'm gonna be in the Cayman Islands, and I am so excited to go. The Cayman Islands are considered one of the best places to dive, um, and I haven't been there before, so, um, so as I was preparing this week for, for um, speaking this morning, all I kept coming up was scuba diving examples because that's where my brain has been. Um, but there, there's one thing I kind of want you to, um, to, to kind of ride with me on here. It was one of the adventures that I had um, before I became a diver, and it was actually the one event that made me desire to, um, to become a certified diver. I've always grown up in the water. I grew up as a competitive swimmer. Um, I love kayaking. I love the ocean, was a lifeguard um, growing up when I was a teenager. Um, and so a friend of mine, there are three of us, we um, traveled to a country called the Republic of Palau. It's in Micronesia. It's over there, um, kind of off of Australia by Fiji. It's a group, group of islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, and so we traveled traveled and we went and I was very excited and at that time two of us were snorkelers and one was a diver. So um, Harriet and I were snorkelers and uh, the visibility there, which means what you can see through the water, it's about 100 feet. Um, so you can see everything around you. It's like being in a big aquarium. It was amazing. So uh, there was this one day that we went out with Karen um, and she dove and Harriet and I said, well, we're just gonna get out of the boat and snorkel around here until she comes back up. Um, so we got out of the boat and there we were snorkeling around and um, just imagine, I mean, we're snorkeling. I have a purple snorkel. I'm, I'm loving all of the brilliant colors um, and we're horizontal um, at the top and we're just kind of snorkeling around we're watching these amazing fish go by, brilliant colors, oranges and purples and blues. And all of a sudden, Harriet taps me, um, and our heads are in the water, and so she's using kind of sign for me, and she says, look, I see a snake. And, and we looked really quick, and sure enough, of what I thought at that time was a snake was going by, and so we followed it um, and for a little while. <clears throat> and then I looked really closely, and it kind of came up a little closer. And I gotta tell you, we were only in about 10 feet of water. That's not very much. It's just, just right there. We were kind of right over it, but you really kind of feel like you're an aquarium. Like somehow there's this big glass partition between you and the animals right there. So we're following it and I look really close and all of a sudden I went, no, it's a moray eel. And that's a sign for it. And a moray eel, it looks like a snake, similar, similar to a snake, except it's got this head that looks like someone stepped on it. And then it's got these huge teeth and this huge mouth. Um, and so 
I, so we, we both kind of stalled a minute. We're like, well, it doesn't really pay attention to us. Let's keep following it. So we kept following it, and all of a sudden, we saw a shark. And let me tell you, this is my very first experience in an ocean with a shark. And sharks are gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. This brilliant gray skin. Um, and it wasn't that big. I mean, it's probably the size of me. Um, so, you know, five, six feet. Um, and it wasn't paying any attention to us. It was following the moray eel. And so Harriet and I were still following the moray eel and now the shark. And the shark, gorgeous gray, it's got little black tips. It was called a black tip reef shark. And uh, we're going and we're not really paying attention very much. And all of a sudden there's two more sharks. So we kind of stalled out. We went, mm, I don't think I'm gonna follow the sharks anymore. But the moray eel happened to come right underneath us. So now we've got three sharks trying to get this moray eel dodging right under us in about 10 feet of water, really close. So I tried to pick up my head without putting my feet down because I thought that would make me closer to those sharks down there. And look up, and Harriet has got, she has big eyes. She's like, what are we gonna do? And we look around and we can't find the boat. I mean, we couldn't even see the boat. I mean, that's how far we, by the way, don't ever do this. It was not smart. So we're like, okay, put our heads back down and let's just calmly swim away from this, these sharks. And we tried that. And then all of a sudden, we looked back down and there are three sharks and there's no more a eel. And those three sharks are circling us, right beneath us. <laughs> And at that point, we started praying. Dear Lord, bring the boat. Where's the boat, God? Bring the boat, because we can't get away from the sharks. And sure enough, um, the, the boat captain came. He saw us, and he, he piloted the boat over, saw us, and he's pulling us up as there's like four, five, six sharks. <laughs> and you know, we get in the boat, and we're feeling pretty good, and we're like, okay, that was actually kind of exciting now that we're in the boat and they're still in there. Um, and the boat captain's talking to us and he said, why did you stay when there is a shark? Don't you know shark behavior? And here he's talking to two snorkelers, two snorkelers that were just in the water looking to see what they could see. We didn't know shark behavior at that time. And although most of you probably do know shark behavior if you watch Shark Week, um, when sharks start circling things, not good, not good. That's actually predatory behavior. Um, so, so note to self, when I dive, anything circles me. I don't care if it's a fish, I don't care if it's a tiny fish, big fish, a school of fish, a shark, anything, I leave. I leave, all done, all done watching. So what I want you to do from my little story, I want you to take your hand out and off to the right hand side of your handout. Without talking, I want you to draw a picture of my little story. Just draw a picture, I'm not gonna look at it. There's no right or wrong answer. Draw what you remember. Draw a little picture off to the side, over here with the, with the uh, lines. I'm gonna give you about two minutes. Just sketch it out. Okay, let's come back together. Um, can I have a volunteer to tell me what color my snorkel was? Purple, purple, purple snorkel. Um, <clears throat> how many people was, were, was I snorkeling with? One other. So how many total were there? There were two of us, right. Did I see the moray eel first or the shark first? Raise your hand. Mm -hmm. The moray eel. Um, at what point in my story did I um, get a little concerned that maybe I wasn't just following something? Really loudly. When I saw that the boat wasn't around, my safety had kind of gone away at that point. Um, what was the one thing in shark behavior that I learned that I've applied now to all of my diving? Yes. 
Then what? Then you get out. Then you get out, yes. <laughs> That's a good job. Perfect. Um, the very first thing, the very first strategy that you will hear readers who are considered good readers. Now, you know and I know that reading is not just reading the words on the page. When we get to the point that we read the words on the page, the next step is comprehending, understanding what we're reading and bringing the pieces together as a whole. So <clears throat> when you ask people that comprehend very well, one of the techniques that they say they do is visualize. Good readers normally create a picture in their head. Because when we're interested in something, we create pictures. We engage with it. We interact with it. So every single one of you, most likely, with something like a shark and the scuba story, probably could write something down on your paper when I said, draw it. That's because when I was speaking, I was trying to draw a picture for you in your head. Um, and when we're interested in something, it's almost something we can't stop doing. I mean, because if you, you, you can pick anything. All of us are interested in different things. If you pick one topic that you enjoy quite a bit, you probably could talk ad nauseum about it. My brother, amazing man, love him to death. He um, absolutely loves history and animal behavior, okay? Just some random things sometimes. Before he was five years old, he had read our entire Britannica encyclopedia set. He loved it. Um, he can talk about the um, breeding techniques of a bird that is only found on the coast of Canada on this little island. You've never even heard of it. And he can tell you every little piece of information about that bird because he's interested in it. But if I were to go and I were to ask him um, something about math, let's say, he's going to look at me and go, hmm, yep. Yeah. I yeah, can't, can't really converse about that, Ginger. That's, that's not really going to work. Because he's actually interested in, in a topic. And when you're interested in a topic, you actually create structures to remember those things or those pieces. And visualizing um, is one of the strategies. It's one of our first big strategies. The very first thing that you do is you imagine. Whether you are hearing a story, you are even watching a story, but especially if you are reading something, the very first thing that you should be thinking about is imagining what you're reading. Start trying to create the picture. And sometimes that's not very easy, especially when it's boring. And we're all always asked to interact with text sometimes, no matter what it is directions that is not that engaging, but it's something we have to get through. So when you imagine you're actually creating this mental image in your head to remember what you're reading. And then to begin to help your brain create that mental image, a lot of times it helps to physically do it, like I had you just sketch that out. Which means you need to teach, comprehending doesn't come naturally. Nobody comprehends naturally. It's not something you're just born with. You have to kind of figure it out and apply strategies at times to do it. And if you are going to create that picture in your head to understand, to remember, and to engage with what you're reading, you're gonna have to learn how to start drawing the picture in your head. And one of the techniques to do that is to jot down next to whatever you're reading little pictures. Because you know what, you guys? Your brain, it's a filing cabinet drawer. If you can walk away with anything today, it's to remember that your brain is a filing cabinet drawer. And everything that we interact with goes in the filing cabinet drawer. 
and we need to learn how to organize our filing cabinet drawer so that when I want to go grab that piece of paper, if you were to say, Ginger, can you please go grab your unit on the environments of the habitats of the ocean? I would go to my filing cabinet drawer. I would go to my science filing cabinet drawer, pull it out. I'd go to my oceanography file section, look into that. I'd look inside my oceanography file section and look for the file folder that says environments and habitats of the ocean and I'd pull that out and there it is. I could very quickly go and retrieve that information. Could I, could I tell you exactly what it is? No, but I knew where to go to get it and your brain is a filing cabinet drawer. We need to learn how to organize the information to access it when we need it and put it away when we don't so it doesn't get all cluttered up there. If you, and this is one of the things, as, as teachers, as any educator um, coming next to you, um, whether it is um, in the classroom academically or um, in your bedroom at home, your family, your educators, your people around you are asking you to organize things. If it all's in a big old pile, it's not accessible. You can't get that information out of there. If you're reading a text and it's boring to you, it's all just jumbled words in your head. One of the strategies to organize the jumbled words is to visualize, to create a picture. And, and in order to do that, the first step is to start making little sketches. You don't have to be an artist. I am a very, very poor artist. Very poor. But that actually helps um, trigger a place that I actually can put information. Questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay, exactly, yeah, and that we're gonna do it. We're gonna do a little activity right now. Yes, a, a visual picture of, if you're a word person, a little note to yourself on the side to remember to create the picture. You need to create the picture in your head. Um, readers that create pictures can read a thousand page novel over a couple weeks period of time and not lose the mental picture in their head of what that looks like. Side note, when you watch a movie before you read a book, it destroys your mental picture. Okay, so we're gonna try this, okay? I would like you to um, flip your page over and it's gonna say a Miller from Canterbury Tales, visualize. And what I would like you to do is when I read this poem from Canterbury Tales, I would like you to draw something on that area right there so that you can remember and you can begin to create your visual picture. If you do this well, you might just start taking notes on what this looks like. But this is the, this is the um, it's a little caveat actually. When you're reading words and you're trying to take notes with words, it actually gets a little jumbled in your head a lot of times. Sketches, drawing, little pieces um, that you just note down, it actually organizes the information better in, you, in your head. So if you struggle at all with understanding what you read after you read it, I would suggest you do not start with words. I would suggest you start with pictures. Because if you do start with the words, most likely you're gonna get stuck on the word you're writing and not hear me say the rest of what I'm reading. And you'll get these jotted pieces of what's happening, okay? If you're drawing pictures and you know nobody's looking at the picture, nobody cares what you drew, it's all just for you, you're creating a space in your head, that filing cabinet drawer, that file, and that file folder to retrieve the information back from. Does that make sense? Okay, let me read. A miller. The miller, stout and sturdy as the stones, delighted in his muscles and big bones. They served him well at fair and tournament. He took the wrestling prize where he went. 
He was short-shouldered, broad, naughty, and tough. He'd tear a door down easily enough. Or break it, charge thickly with his head. His beard, like any sour fox, was red. And broadly built as though it were a spade, upon the tip-top of his nose, he had a wart. And therein stood a tuft of hairs, bright as the bristles of her red sow's ears. His nostrils matched the miller black and wide. He bore a sword and buckler by his side. His mouth was broad as a great furnace door. He loved to tell a joke and boast and roar. About as many sins and devil trees, he stole and multiplied his thefts by threes. And yet he had a thumb of gold, tis true. He wore a white coat and a hood of blue. And he could blow the bagpipe up and down. And with the tune, he brought us out of town. I'm going to reread the very first uh, stanza. The miller, stout and sturdy as the stones, delighted in his muscles and his big bones. They served him well at fair and tournament. He took the wrestling prize where'er he went. He was short-shouldered, broad, naughty, and tough. He'd tear, he'd tear a door down easily enough, or break it, charging thickly with his head. Um, can somebody tell me two things they remember about the poem? Huh? That the miller was like big and strong. Yeah, he's a big and strong guy. What else? He had a wart. He had a wart. Where was his no wart? On his nose. On his nose. And what was special about that wart? He had hair on it. He had hair on it. And someone that hasn't answered. What color was the hair coming out of the wart on his nose? Red. Red. Yeah. What color was the hair on his head? Red. Red. Okay. Um, that, I, I don't know if you were able to create a picture. <clears throat> Sometimes it is easier for people just to listen and not jot down first. So another strategy when you're looking at visualizing or understanding, especially something like a poem, um, a story, a little narrative, a paragraph, sometimes you have to read like two or three paragraphs and get the whole understanding. A lot of times it actually helps to um, just listen to it first if someone else is reading it and then stop and write your picture and what that is. Okay, but that's strategy number one. And that's a little bit of an example of how we do it. Any questions on visualizing and how that can help you or, or what to do? Did it help you? Did it help you a little bit? Yes. <laughs> hey, you know what? Like I said, nobody cares what you're drawing. The, the, drawing, the mental picture is actually what you want. Okay, so the drawing is actually just a step to get to the mental picture. If you, if you create mental pictures very well already, then you may not need to go backwards to the drawing, okay? Um, what I would challenge you is to say that when I get done speaking in the next 15 minutes <clears throat> and you didn't write anything down, See if you can um, tell me facts about what I read. Because when other things happen and interact in our brains, um, we need to make sure that we filed that correctly and that we can access that file correctly. So that would be kind of your, um, your test for yourself, what that looks like. So, um, did, so did that help? A little bit, yes? OK, great. Let's move on. Move on. Um, so in your packet, you have a sheet of paper that looks like a big black blob on top. Sort of looks like someone has a baseball bat. And then there is a narrative, a short little narrative. And we're going to be looking at this next. 
<clears throat> the next strategy that readers say that they um, utilize to understand what they're reading is actually called questioning. And you know, as parents, um, as educators, um, and as adults, let's just throw it all together, sometimes we're not so okay with questioning. Um, I can remember growing up, and uh, for years I got stuck on the why. Mom, why? And I got her to the point that, bless her heart, the only thing she could end up saying to me was because I said so. How many of you heard that? Yeah, why? Because I, because I said so. Just do it. All right. And then I'd come back a little while and say, but why? What, what, why do I have to do it? What, how's it going to benefit me? Let me tell you, there is positive aspects to questioning, and a lot of times, questioning curiosity actually creates engagement with what we're doing. So if that means you are doing an activity and you're questioning the activity, that is actually positive. Your brain is engaged. We want you to question. When you're reading, it, it is something that we don't, we don't make the natural transition to. But when you're reading something, it is actually really good to question. But here's the little um, stickler. You can wonder about things that don't have an answer. We all do. We all wonder about things that don't have an answer. Why did something happen? I wonder if, dot, dot, dot. I wonder how that could have happened. And as a teacher, I have learned that my students consistently want me to give them the answer. And consistently, the very best thing for me is not to give an answer. Because the questions are where the engagement is, and normally, you'll be able to find a resource to find out the answer to that. And that is what learning is all about. You will never know the answer to every question out there. But I would um, guarantee that you can learn the strategies to get the answer to anything that you're looking for, especially with the internet now. So, um, I wonder. <clears throat> I wonder is the very best strategy that you can begin to employ when you're reading something and when you're beginning to read something. I wonder. Let's look at the text. 200 years ago, it was widely believed that women had a smaller capacity to learn than men. As a result, the educational system was geared primarily toward males. Over time, women fought against and toppled many of the barriers that prevented them from getting an equal education. But as recently as 30 years ago, they still faced some daunting hurdles. Studies showed that female students were being shortchanged from grade school through graduate school. In fact, many colleges and professional schools set limits on the number of young women they would admit. Others refused to admit women at all. In 1972, Congress acted to eliminate gender discrimination in schools by passing what is referred as the Title IX of Education Amendment Act. Title IX requires that federally funded schools give females the same opportunities as males in all education programs, including athletics. In principle, the law was simple. By getting schools to comply with Title IX has been another story. <clears throat> One family in Nebraska seeking equal resources for girls at their community high school found out just how resistant to change some people can be. <clears throat> Let's go back. I'm going to reread it, and I'm going to pause after every couple of sentences. And whenever you come up with a question, and I wonder question, write it down, I'll, I'll show you an example first. At the very end, it says, in principle, this last paragraph, middle of the page, in principle, the law was simple, but getting schools to comply with Title IX has been another story. I wonder if there was a certain area of the United States that it was actually more difficult to, to get schools to comply with. I wonder, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I wonder how, how, how <clears throat> long it took 
for us to actually pass an amendment to say that girls received equal education. And then I wonder how long it's been, or maybe if we still have schools out there that don't offer girls the same education. We still have colleges that still have a limit on how many girls that they, they would attend. Those are two things I'd wonder about. Okay, so what I want you to do is I want you to write I wonder down. And there are three different prompts that you can think about. I wonder where, I wonder why, and I wonder how. Where, where, why, and how. What is one question you came up with? Anybody? Why did you pick this topic? Okay, good question. Mm, yes? I wonder how they overcame the obstacles. Okay, wonder how. how what, what did they do? How did they overcome it? Anybody else? Yes? I wonder how you would know the college was putting a limit on. Say that again. I wonder how you would know the college was putting a limit on. That's a good question. How would you know that the colleges were actually putting a limit on how many girls they admitted? Yeah? When was it when, when, when is this taking place and does this take place? When does the story take, when was the article written, and, when, and is it still happening? You realize I'm not answering any of your questions. Anybody else? Okay. That's a really good question. I thought of that too. Why was it widely believed that women had a smaller capacity than men to learn? Yes. Um, I can't, why, why so recent? Why only 30 years ago? Why didn't women take action sooner? Oh, that's a good question. Why didn't women take action sooner? Why, why was it only 30 years ago that they started really um, kind of questioning of what that is? I'm gonna stop us there. Um, you will note that when we asked a question, most likely your brain was trying to answer the question, coming up with your own answers. That's engagement. When you're engaged with the text, you remember the text, and you remember what it's talking about, and that's a comprehension strategy. So when you go home tonight, and you're sitting around the dinner table, you actually may remember some of these questions. If, you know, it was of interest to you. If it wasn't, you probably won't. But no matter what the text is that we engage with, when we, when we deploy a strategy to question the text, it's not being um, adversarial to question the text. It is actually allowing your brain to begin to engage with the context of what is being talked about. Are there any ridiculous questions? What do you think? There really aren't. I mean, you can say yes, there's ridiculous questions, but the only ridiculous question is one that you pulled out of the sky and had nothing to do with the text. I didn't hear any ridiculous questions here. None. Granted, if you had a ridiculous question that you wrote down, you probably wouldn't have wanted to share it in the, in the open environment that we have going on here. But still, you need to remember, students, you don't be timid to interact with stuff like this. Don't be shy to ask your mom, ask your dad, what's going on? How do we do this? Jot the questions down. There may not be answers. You need to be okay with that. Moms, dads, educators, you need to be okay with not knowing the answer. And if it's an answer that you really want to get the answer to, help your child find the answer. Help the, lead the child to a resource that can actually get them the answer because there are resources out there that can, that can easily give us the answer to a lot of our questions. Um, but 
Let me tell you, this was only the intro to the article. So in, in talking about this, if I stopped right here and I had you do those questions, you now prepared yourself and built a file folder in your head to see the answers when you read them. Make sense? That is actually the power of a strategy like this. You do not read the entire article and then try to come up with questions. Way too many words in your head. All will get jumbled around in there and there will be no file folders. It will be all the papers in the filing cabinet drawer together. And you'll try to go pick up one. And then after you get to one, you're, that's probably all the facts you'll remember. If you stop periodically in your reading and ask yourself questions that are like leading questions to you, I wonder questions, then you're creating the place in your brain to store the answer when your eyes read it. And you don't have to cognitively think about getting the answer. Make sense? Yeah? Okay. Any questions about that strategy? No, silence. Which strategy did you like better, visualize or I wonder? Raise your hand if you like visualize better. Raise your hand if you like I wonder better. Great, um, is there a better strategy, visualize or I wonder? Nope, if it's something that can help you remember, it's good. Let's go to the next one. And Robin, I know um, I had until 10.15 and we started a little bit late. What time would you like me to end? Um, it's like 10.47. Oh, okay, all right. Um, this last one we're probably gonna, we're gonna um, gaze through because it is actually a strategy that a lot of you may already um, utilize. But it's called Scope it out. Scope it out. And this is a lovely little acronym that I like because when we talk about scope it out, you utilize the strategy scope it out. When you are looking at an academic textbook that is very boring and you have to read 15 pages of it and you fall asleep in the second paragraph, because it is very boring. Now, I gotta tell you, I love, love being an educator. Absolutely love it. I love taking a topic and teaching English and science and attaching that to it and creating projects and engaging with, um, with the students in, in what we're doing. Absolutely love it. My very favorite topic to choose content from is history, if you haven't figured it out already. Um, because I just think that there's so much to learn. But can I just tell you, in high school and in college, I did not like history. Matter of fact, I got a C in history every single time I took history because I thought it was so boring that I would just do enough to pass <laughs> and move it on. And it wasn't until I became a teacher that I actually started finding aspects of history that I really did enjoy and realized, wow, I should have paid a little bit closer attention because now I'm gonna have to learn all this stuff anew. Well, history textbooks, I think history textbooks, science textbooks, but even now as an educator, um, I am um, entering my doctorate program. Um, and at, in my doctorate program, can I just tell you the amount of reading you have to do? It's a lot. I was given a, a book that had 6,000 pages in it. 6,000 of them, that's a lot of pages. And we were told that we had one week in order to read it. And I went, really? That's great. I work full time, by the way. Um, I have like, you know, 60, 70 hour work week. And I had one week to get through this huge book and I didn't know how I was gonna do it. I used Scope It Out and it worked. Scope it out. When you look at Scope It Out, basically what you're looking at is instead of 
giving, instead of telling yourself, I have to read every word on every page, I actually tell, give myself permission and a lot of grace, telling me, you know what? What I need to do with this book is know the main points, to know where to find the details if I'm asked the details. Do I need to remember every detail in a 6,000 page book? That is impossible, at least for me. Do I need to know how to figure out where to go in 6,000 pages to find out if dot, 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 to answer a question? And it's not gonna help if I start at the beginning and I start thumbing through it. Because I haven't created the filing cabinet drawer in my head yet. Scope it out. The very first thing you do when you're looking at anything is you read the subtitles. Oh, let's just say read the title first, too. So on any chapter book that you look, and I actually did not grab a chapter book for you here. Um, I had made a copy of a book called Free at Last, and it actually goes across um, and details aspects of the civil rights movement. But this is actually very similar to an academic book that you would see. It's got a picture, it's got some captions, it's got a title, it's got some subtitles involved, it's got bold words. Um, and they, publishers try to do that to try to engage you. But what we get is we start at the beginning and literally by the time we get about here, we've kind of begun to forget what we started um, reading when we're looking at it. So the very first part of Scope It Out, scope it out is the S, read your subtitles. So I would read this and I'd say my title is Civil Rights Leader Killed After Promotion to White Job, Natchez, Mississippi. My subtitles are um, Warless Jackson, Act of Savagery, February 27th, 1967. Starting to create the files, okay? Gave me a big picture. Did I read any of the, the little words? Not yet. First read the subtitles, then read the captions. Y'all love pictures? Read those captions. They tell you a lot of where the details are. The captions to this says, Warless Jackson had begun to climb out of the darkness into the light, and for this he was cut down. Hmm, I wonder how he was cut down. Um, left picture over here, it says white resistance strengthened as civil rights activities intensified in Mississippi. It took great courage to defy the barriers of racial segregation. Gave me a little bit more information, right? So some, somehow there's a lot of courage. Maybe this Warless Jackson actually utilized courage to defy the boundaries of segregation, just from a caption. The last caption reads, the explosion left Jackson's pickup truck in pieces. Wonder what happened to Jackson. I have a pretty good idea right now, right? He's involved in the civil rights movement. I got that from the subtitle. Um, there was some tension in Mississippi because that was in the title too. Act of savagery, some, somebody or something happened in which it, it appeared to be drastic. And there's a picture of Jackson's blown up car, and it says he was murdered. Okay, I've got, my, I've got my big folders right now. Now all I need is the little details that go in them. Objective, the first sentences. It, this works probably 75% of the time. If you read the very first sentence of each paragraph, you will now fill in the details to your file folders. You don't need to read every single sentence. 75% of the time, people who write articles, academic books, actually put the content of the paragraph in the first sentence, and the rest of the time, where normally is the content? Anybody know? If it's not in the first sentence, it's in the last sentence. Okay, so the very first thing I would do is in each group, I'd read the first sentence, give myself a little bit more detail. Hmm, Mississippi, Natchez, Warless Jackson, blown up in a car, he did something um, in which someone uh, was, was or murdered. 
I'm gonna read the first sentences, see if you can get more detail. For Warless Jackson, getting in the car to go to work each day was an act of courage. Jackson hesitated before accepting the promotion. George Metcalf gave his friend a word of advice when Jackson took the new job. Always check under the hood of your truck before you start it. The murder of Warless Jackson brought sharp reactions from both blacks and whites in Natchez. The murder and Evers' stern response spurred white officials into quick action. Nevertheless, Jackson's killers were never identified. Warless Jackson was given a military funeral service on March 5th, 1967. After reading those first sentences, do I need to read any more of the words on that page? Not at all. I move on, next page of my book. I got Warless Jackson, he was killed, blew up in a car. Um, he took a promotion for a job um, and somehow that angered the whites in the area. And it was obviously if someone, if someone warned him to check under the hood of his car, there's probably a bomb that had recently gone off from another person that accepted a promotion. Um, so, so really, if you read first objective, subtitles, captions, objective, the first sentences, and then you actually look at the pictures, really look at them, tell, show you what they're saying, really, really look at it. If I look at this picture, I see a little boy, I wanna say eight, nine, 10 years old, he has, he's holding a sign that says, segregation is God's plan, Genesis 1, 24, 25, and 26. Okay, that gives me a little bit more information about the environment that this happened in at the time. And then the last thing you do is eye-catching. Look at the page, and does anything stand out? Is it color? Is it bold? Does it a, is it a different font? Is it in italics? Anything that is eye-catching for you when you scan it. You're not reading, you're just scanning. Read that. After you scope it out, you read the subtitles, you read the captions, you read the objective or the first sentences, you look at the pictures and you look at anything eye-catching, really, you're done. If you do that in an entire chapter of history, you've got it made. You can go back exactly and figure out if they wanna know exactly what happened, I kinda know which, which part of the page I need to go back and look for and look at the details. Make sense? Yes. Okay, scope it out. So next, I get it. I started out saying I read this, but I don't really get it because that is a common statement that students, adults make. I really, I did read it. It's not that I didn't read it. I read it, mom. I just don't get what it says. I don't understand, it doesn't make any sense. All right. You have three strategies now that you can look at. You can visualize it, you can question do I wonder, or you can scope it out if you need the details of what it is. And if you utilize those three strategies, you're gonna get it. You'll get it, you'll move on. All right, that's it, thank you very much. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.